I am live. It is the 11th of July 2023 and I am reading out of Life as Carola. This uh, plays uh, in the early 16th century. Carola was born on the 4th of May 1510. And she is a, a far memory of Joan Grant, who was a far memory writer. She lived from 1907 till 1989. And this is her life as Carola, a young uh, woman now. Uh, she was the illegitimate child of Lord Griffin and she was banished out of the park castle where she was born and her mother died in a battle. Uh, well, she got a knife in her back, actually. Uh, Carola is now, uh, we are now in chapter 17, and uh, we just uh, heard, read about Anthony the Glassmaker, and we are now Heal the Sick. I worked only for a short time in the refectory garden with the other novices before Sister Ignatia claimed me as her pupil. She used to say, you seem to have such a kinship with the plants that if you cut your hand, I think, it would run with sap instead of blood. I was, looking, uh, I was happy looking after the flowers, but after a few weeks I asked the abbess to let me learn the virtues of those plants which God had given man to secure him. I knew that it might be a long time before I was told the secrets of the formulas, but soon I was allowed to help in the preparation of herbals distilling essences, grinding twigs and aromatic bark into powder, or covering pots of salve with a film of wax to keep them fresh. When I was considered to be sufficiently experienced, I was given summary advice on how to apply a bandage. Then, as were the others, I was given a flask of lotion and a jar of salve, with which I was to cleanse or anoint the the wounds after I had washed them with water from the well in the outer courtyard. I carried a bundle of clean rags to be used as bandages, and as I followed the, run, the nun in authority, who took with her a basket in which were knives and gouges and a pair of pincers, I found that I was more fearful of the things I was going to see than I had ever been when Lucia had the pox. In those days, cripples and disease had been familiar to me. I could even look on the face of an old leper without flinching, but since I had been hidden from the ugliness of the flesh, I could not so easy armour myself against it. One by one, the pilgrims filed through the outer door. A blind man led by a lame child, a girl with a wizened baby in her arms, an idiot boy trying to break away from his mother's restraining hold, a man cradling his diseased hand with the other, a cripple dragging himself along on his elbows, the stumps of his legs, making two straight ruts in the thick dust, and still they came. Then the thin tinkle of a leopard's bell as he crawled through the gate to cower in the far corner, crossing himself with that what once had been a hand. The feet of the blind man were cracked with running sores. I knelt to wash them, but he said, it is my eyes, please give me back my sight. It is so dark, always, so dark. There was a film over his eyes like the white of an egg. I whispered to the nun, what can we do for him? She answered, nothing, he will always be blind. The man heard her and put out his hand to feel for the child that guided him. Take me home. I thought God had forgiven me, but he is still angry. Tears gathered in his sightless eyes and drove a glistening path down his dry cheek. I ran after him. You're blind only when you are awake. Sleep and you shall see. See things more beautiful than your eyes could tell you about. He halted. I can tell by your voice that you are young. Are you blind too? No, not blind as you mean, though there is much I cannot see. My pity for you, I lost the sight of one eye a year before the other left me. Try and remember while you can still see, so as to take something with you into the dark. A novice brushed past me. Be careful, the sister is watching you, we are not allowed to talk. I went to fetch more water from the well. 
and left the blind man listening for my voice. A woman was sitting in the shade of the wall with a little boy across her lap. He cannot have been more than six years old, though he had the face of an old man. She was no longer young, and even the weight of that wasted body must have been a difficult burden for her to carry up the steep hill. Her face was pale with the heat, and her shoulders were heavy with fatigue. Most of the pilgrims called out for us to come to them, or tried somehow to attract our attention, but this woman seemed almost apathetic. None of the others took any notice of her. Perhaps it was so long since they had been exhausted that they were, did not know how, after endurance has made one reach a goal, one often sits placidly, drained of ambition, empty of hope. I gave her a cup of water before I took the child from her. His leg was bound to a piece of wood with strips of dirty rag. There was no childishness in his face. His eyes were wide and full as a hare's. His skin clung to the bones of his skull as if it were trying to nourish itself on this meagre skeleton. His mother would have followed me, but I told her to rest there until I came back. She gave me the blurred smile of extreme weariness, and her head jerked forward as she fell into sleep. In a corner of the courtyard there was a stone bench under an old fig tree. A bow of its rough, heavy leaves hung down and shielded the rest of the sufferers from the child's sight. I had to fetch a knife to cut the rags, for the knots were hard with crusted blood and pus. I soaked the bandages with water to loosen it, and when I took it off, a splinter of bone sloughed away with it. Where the knee should have been, there was a pit of rotting flesh. The stench of decay rose from it, tangible as oily smoke. The child did not cry or whimper. He looked as though he had been born into pain, and long ago had found no cry was loud enough to drown the shrieking of his flesh. I cleansed his wound as best as I could, and then smeared it with salve. I knew that only a miracle could give him ease. I wonder if any of the nuns were near enough to the Christ they followed to have gained so great a measure of his teaching that they could heal nearly as strongly as he had healed. I plucked at the habit of a nun who was passing. Tell whomsoever among you can heal most powerfully that she is needed here. She looked at the wound and said kindly, You have done well. There's nothing more you can do except put on the bandages. There's nothing more anyone can do. I was bewildered, then angry. Do you not think this child worthy of your healing? You profess to love God. How then can you deny the healing of his son to this child? What have I denied him? The only power that will make his flesh whole again. You know as well as I do that salves cannot help this child. Heal him or fetch someone who will. I know what you feel. I was the same as you when I first did this work. But even if one of us were a physician, it would do no good. Then, as though remembering her authority, but you must be stronger of stomach. You will soon learn to grow less queasy. Do you think I asked you to send someone else because I wished to avoid putting on the salve and wrapping the bandages? She nodded. I've been too long in charge of the novices to be deceived by them. I think it was only then that I realized that was not, it was not lack of compassion that made her withheld the power, the power, the power of feeling, but ignorance of his existence. And I knew why, though I had been instructed in the use of salves and balms, I had been told nothing of the mysteries. It was because no one here knew that there were mysteries. As I looked at her, saw her bland smile, so that she thought she had outwitted me in a petty conceit. I forgot authority and said, You pitiable fool. Okay, I stop this here because the next one is quite a long chapter. This was the second part of chapter 17.